haven't been through any midnight hours, you will. You will go through some. And I've had some. You may have a church as wonderful as this with people that pray for you. You may have a beautiful wife and family that looks out for you in your midnight hour there is one who will be right there with you the whole time as nobody else can do. And I will say his name in this song. Because I've been so faithful, not because I've been so good. You've always been there for me to provide my every need. You were there when I was lonely, you were there through all my pain, guiding my footsteps shelter from the rain and it was you who made my life complete you are to me my everything and that is why I sing Jesus I love Because you care. Oh. 
Let the people of God say amen. Amen. I want to ask if you're able, if you would stand with me in reverence to the reading of God's holy word. God's word can be found again this week in John's gospel, chapter 14, verse 12, and in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. John's gospel says, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And then Philippians 2, 5, and your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Amen. You may be seated in God's house. And as we continue our series, we started last week entitled, Go Be Great. I'd like to tag this particular text and message with the title, Invisible Greatness. Invisible Greatness. A man had bought a new gadget. It was unassembled, of course. And after reading and reading the instructions, he could not figure out how to put it together. Finally, he sought the help of an old handyman who was working in his backyard. The old fellow picked up the pieces, studied the pieces, and then began assembling the gadget. In a very short time, he had put the gadget together. The, the man said, man, that's amazing, and you did it without even looking at the instructions. The old handyman looked at him and said, the fact is, I can't read. And when a fellow can't read, he got to think with his mind. Last week, we discussed how if your thought life is going to be like Jesus, if you're going to focus on the good news of God's love, then you must trust in God's prophetic certainty. If you're going to be great and do even greater works, the Bible cannot just be simply some book with some good metaphysical commentary, some good things for you to quote, but the Bible's trumpeting of love, prayer, and faith must permeate who you are. According to Dr. King, love is still the most durable power that there is in the world. He suggested that this creative force, as beautifully modeled in the life of Jesus, is the most powerful instrument available to men and women in our quest for peace, unity, and security. And this love thing, this idea of love as a weapon against hatred, evil, racism, problems, plights, low wages, underemployment, that ought to be in the church's wheelhouse. Love ought to be our area of expertise. The world ought to come to us for advice on love. But the question is, do they? Does the world come to the church for advice on love? This ought to be who we are, what we do, how we live, but we've got to get it in our minds that we are the most powerful positive force in the world when we let the mind of the master be the master of our minds. And when the word of God, his love permeate who you are, it becomes contagious. And so in a real sense, we need parents and single and married, we need par folks parenting with changed minds. We need legislators legislating with changed minds, teachers teaching with changed minds, nurses nursing with changed minds. Because the changed mind knows, like the psalmist in the 16th Psalm, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. And we need changed minds because it is so easy for us to imagine what we are not, to expect so much of others and so little of ourselves to always be accusing somebody else and justifying ourselves and people that we like. Dr. James Sanders, an Old Testament scholar, pointed out in his book, God Has a Story Too, that the Bible is a mirror in which you ought to see yourself. And if your mind is not changed, then you will read the Bible and you will always come away self-satisfied feeling self-righteous, and I'm afraid you, you're misreading it if, if you're reading it and you become self-satisfied with how wonderful you are. In the trial and the death of Jesus, you and I are never Jesus. 
What sacrifice of life or in life have we made? No, no, no. When, when, when you read the book and your mind is changed, you realize that you are the high priest trying to protect your prizes and your position, your power, and your pleasure. You and I are often Judas deciding that Jesus has had enough time to prove himself to us, so we got to take this in our own hands. We are Peter, scared of the public's opinion about us. We are the crowd ready to follow who or, or what is popular in that day, the change mind knows that when you read the word your pride is shattered and you realize that it's only God's mercy and God's grace that have kept you here as long as you've been here let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus there is an observable phenomenon that operates inside of all of us this this nameless thing and some of us is out in the open in everything that we say and we do it shows up in how you walk and you talk it shows up in how you hold up in adversity it shows up in how you bear your burdens and other folks this thing does not lie in open view but it's covered by layers and layers of what Gardner Taylor calls ordinariness uh, covered sometimes by frustration and anxiety but it's still in there and many people it lies unseen like unborn music in the belly of a cassavant organ waiting for some master musician to touch the keys and call forth those previously unheard melodies and notes. Uh, this is the thing that makes you unique. It sets you apart. It gives you your distinction and it's the driving force behind your excellence. It's there because God made you and you're made in his image. Uh, and in God's image you've got opportunity. In God's image you've got ability. In God's image you've got an anointing. Uh, in God's image you can be prophetic in God's image you've got light and life in God's image you can see yourself as God sees you in God's image you got somebody in God who believes in you this thing is described as the godness that's in every life that's in here you know you got some godness in your life. You got some godness inside of you. That little touch of flavor that God added when he made you like he made you. That little subtle change that he made when he created you that makes you who you are. That makes you wonderful in the sight of God. It is his godness. Man, man, imagine that. You think about that. Every day you get up, you got godness inside your life godness godness you got godness because he breathed into you and gave you a part of himself when he when he made life and gave you life to live abundantly god and the engineer of the universe created you with the ability to decide whether or not you're going to let that godness guide your life you know, if God was so inclined, he could have forced all of us to think the same way, to look the same way, to act the same way. But he made you unique so we could fulfill the great unique roles that all of us have in the world. It's God then. Since you got Godness in you, then it's God who you should try to mold your thinking after. Because since God created your mind, it's God who's able to best show you how to use the mind he gave you. I brought two Bible buddies with me to help deal with this mind issue. I believe Moses suggested that you will know that the Lord has sent me to do these works, for I have not done them of my own mind. Because I yielded my mind a long time ago to be the same mind that was in God. Isaiah said, said that he'll keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. There's just something about having a mind that believes and is focused and fixed on godliness and Christ-centered optimism. A, a mind that believes that the impossible is possible with God. A mind that believes in the power of faith, prayer, and love. A, a mind that says I might not be able to see it with my eyes, uh, but just because I can't see it doesn't mean that my God God cannot do it. Construction crew was building a new road through this rural area, knocking down trees as it kept, kept progressing. A superintendent noticed that one tree had a nest of birds that couldn't fly yet, and he marked the tree so that they would not cut it down. Several weeks later, the superintendent came back to the tree. He got in the, into his truck and was lifted up uh, so that he could see inside the nest. The little fledglings, the baby birds were gone. They had obviously learned how to fly. So the superintendent called over the team and said, y'all can cut the tree down now. As the tree crashed to the ground, the nest fell clear, and some of the material that the birds had gathered to make the nest was scattered about. Part of it was a scrap from a church called Antioch Baptist Church, and on the scrap of paper were these words. It was just four words, and all the four words said was, God can do it. And you, you got to begin to develop a mind that's got no fear for tomorrow 
tomorrow, that has no fear for the future, that's got no fear of what you're going to face because all you know is God can do it. Uh, when the test comes, God can do it. Uh, when the surgery comes, God can do it. Uh, when I got to choose the right way, God can do it. When I want a new career, God can do it. When my money is funny or my money is tight, God can do it. You got to convince your mind that God can do it. When you fall, you got to believe God can get you back up. God can do it. The old sailors before, there were technological instruments. They sailed and they could not depend on the sea because the sea was always changing. There was no sight of land and the only thing that they had was the North Star as they sailed in the, by the direction that the light from the North Star gave. They made up their mind that they would not entertain thoughts of traveling based on Orion's belt, based on the moon or the sun, based on finding the Milky Way, because that stuff wasn't always visible. They made up their minds that nothing would cause them to waver from following that North Star. And every believer, every person need in your life a North Star. You need the unchanging presence that is the same in the darkness as it is in the light. It's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Your mind needs to attach itself to the idea that you will travel into some uncomfortable places. You will do something that you've never done. You will journey to places that you don't like and don't feel good to you because you believe that your North Star is going to guide you. Our North Star is Jesus who is unchanging. And if you would challenge your mind to believe that the path of God is the the best path. Uh, his plan is the best plan. Uh, his way is the best way. That his end is the best end. Uh, that his move is the best move. Then you will activate the godness that's inside of you. But I hear you asking the same question. I had to ask the text. How, how do I show forth this invisible greatness, this godness that God put inside of me first? Two answers and I sit down first. You got to learn how to serve with gladness. Uh, don't just serve. Don't just serve, but you got to serve with gladness. Paul is familiar with the Psalms in Philippians here when in the beginning of the letter uh, he tells the people to serve. He sees in life of Jesus the psalmist dreams and desires for what service should look like. Serve the Lord with gladness is what Pastor Paul is telling the Philippian church because this is the kind of mind Jesus has. A, a mind so fixed on serving that he did not come to save himself, to get prizes and pleasure for himself, to get notoriety and fame for himself, but that the world that's you and me through him might live productive, powerful, and prayerful lives. Uh, that we might be made whole, that we might be saved uh, is saved from hellfire, saved uh, from our condemnation and our damnation. So you and I got to learn how to serve the Lord with gladness, with gladness. In serving with gladness, working with joy, you become great, capable of expressing your complete trust in God at all times. See, Paul had written to the Colossian cousins of the Philippian church that in being fruitful in every good work, we then increase in knowledge of God. That service is the gatekeeper. You do know service is the gatekeeper for you gaining knowledge. Knowledge is seated in the mind and the way you grow in knowledge is by doing more in service for Jesus. The more I do in service for Christ, the more I grow in knowledge. And some of you believe that your service in the church is serving the Lord with gladness. But your mark is made in doing the work you do, using your intelligence, your place of business, your school, seeing those places at places where you are serving Christ. When a good teacher teaches well, they are serving the Lord with gladness. When an architect designs a beautiful space and they do it with integrity, when a driver drives you around with commitment and care, they are serving the Lord with gladness. Being example of good work ethic is serving with gladness and our worship would be so much more powerful if Sunday was simply a gathering of servants who've been serving the Lord all week long. Grandmama, the way you, you help treat your grandbabies. Granddaddy, the way you treat your grandbabies is serving the Lord with gladness. Parents, the way you treat your children and raise your family is serving the Lord with gladness. There ought to be an outward expression of the presence of God in your life, and that outward expression should be your service. Service of Christ is an outward expression of the manifold presence of God. When you serve with gladness in your service, guess what? It will produce fruit. 
Don't tell me you're serving. You just gotta, you just gotta show me your life. I, I, the fruit is that you're serving with gladness. And me, mean folks sprout with pleasing thoughts and words when you start serving the Lord with gladness. If you serve with gladness, your sadness will break for joy. Uh, serve with gladness, and confusion gives way to peace. Uh, serve with gladness, and don't you ever refuse parenthetically to sing. Uh, see, gladness and singing go hand in hand. Uh, for I sing because I'm happy, uh, and I can be happy even if my happenings ain't happy like I want them to happen because I got joy uh, and then I sing because I'm free uh, so don't you ever let a song die in your heart serve with gladness and you keep finding a song to sing uh, you can sing through tough times and trial uh, you can sing through marital issues uh, you can sing when your children in trouble uh, you can sing and what will you sing in your soul uh, you can sing where he leads me that's where I'm gonna follow uh, you can sing I'm so glad uh, that trouble don't last always you can sing what a friend we have in Jesus when you serve with gladness you will always keep a song in your heart a song drives out negative thoughts a song reminds you of how much God loves you a song can keep your spirit renewed a song can lift up your head serve the Lord with gladness I I've learned I've learned from Sister Valerie Harrison, uh, uh, who's a master horticulturist, that, that the quality of your fruits and vegetables in the garden is directly affected by the great quality of the soil. In order to produce great vegetation, it starts by having great soil. And you need to make sure that you are planting your life in some, some friend soil, some relationship soil, some ministry soil that's good so you can grow in, in your grace and in your knowledge of who God is. Uh, you don't need a dry, rotted, stale, stuffy religion, a gospel that only works inside this building. That's greenhouse faith. We don't need greenhouse faith. See, such a plant can survive and thrive as long as the temperature is kept moderate and constant. As long as everything is working in your favor in the greenhouse, the greenhouse, the greenhouse is constant. The temperature is the same. It, it cannot stand shifts in the temperature. It wilts under the pressure. As soon as pressure comes, you stop loving it. You stop forgiving. You stop being faithful. You got to get you some new soil. Get your life in some great soil so you can grow some soil that on the bag, that it, on the bag it reads, I've been crucified with Christ. Get you some soil where the bag says, it's no longer I who live, but Jesus who lives in me. Some soil that says, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. Some soil that says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Get into some of that nutrient-rich, dense, fibrous soil so you can grow in God. Serve the Lord with gladness. And in serving the Lord with gladness, it helps you find good soil. You're just planted. Uh, 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 you ought to always be growing because you're always serving. It's serving. Builds your strength. Serving. Builds your character. And if you are today where you were last January, check your soil. The problem is you might just be planted on the surface so you're easy to uproot. Uh, we need weed believers. Weeds are hard to get up. You you try to get up a weed, you just pull and pull. The weeds are deeply embedded in the soil. We need some weed believers who you just can't be uprooted just by any old thing. You got to do some work to make me lose my religion. Your soil, change the eye to it. You, your soul is too shallow. You got to go down in the soil, go down in your relationship with God until you hit redemption and salvation and grace, until you find mercy and favor and love and peace. Go down, and when you hit those, your life will start to bear new fruit. Stop digging so shallow. I go to church. That's shallow. I, I try to be good. Shallow. I try not to cuss folk out. That's shallow. I ain't a bad person. I'm really a good person, shallow. I, I know the pages of the Bible, but not the person of the Bible, I'm shallow. But you got to dig in the soil of service until you hit forgiveness. Dig until your life is changed and your soul is upset. Dig until you walk in more walk with God moment by moment and day by day. Dig until you really love your neighbor as yourself and you find yourself praying for those who spitefully use you. You got to dig, dig, dig way down in the soil of service. Serve the Lord with gladness. 
But not only do you need to serve the Lord with gladness, but secondly and finally, if you're going to unlock that godness, that invisible greatness in your life and in your soul, secondly, you got to learn to strive, strain, and stretch for greatness. Got to strive for greatness, not just average. Most of us are content being average. But I, the Bible doesn't say we are average conquerors through Jesus the Christ. It doesn't say I came that you might have life and have life more average. Averagely. I, I can do average things through Christ who, who gives, me, gives me strength. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Then I get to the part where he prepares an average table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup is average. It doesn't run over. It's just right in the middle. Just enough drink for me and just to sip, get a swig on on what God is doing. That ain't what the Lord says. We got to strive for great. Dr. Luke records an occasion when Jesus tells his own mama, he says, Mary and his father, Joseph, he says, I must be about my father's business. I was going to say business, but business. I got some educated people here. He was essentially telling his earthly parents, I'm striving for the greatness inside of me, and I've got this urgency to unwrap whatever gifts God has given to me and use them to glorify his name. See, greatness starts by planting seeds of greatness in your mind. Remember last week, I told you it's all in your head. If you want to be great, you got to have the mentality of a servant. Dr. King suggested that anybody can be great because anybody can serve. And I'm not only talking about serving through the labor of your hands or the work that you do, but you got to learn to serve the vision and the mission of Jesus the Christ. Greatness comes when you walk in the complete purpose of God. God is telling you that greatness might make you uncomfortable. Not always going to be comfortable at church. Not always going to be comfortable in life. Greatness might mean leaving the familiar. Greatness might mean that you got to leave some people behind. Greatness might mean not knowing where God is taking you or leading you. But if you want to be great according to God, you must be willing to take a chance on God. It's a mockery of Jesus' church who came that we might have life fully and abundantly, not averagely, for you to hang out in some halfway house of the Spirit. For you to be comfortable chilling on average. That is a mockery of Jesus. And say, average work shall you do because I'm going to the Father. Average, average, average works. You can just do average works and be an average person and just get up every day and do what everybody else does. That's not what he said. He said, greater works. So it's a mockery of Jesus who came that we might have life and have it abundantly for us to hang out in the hallway of average. Yet there are believers, some here, some abroad, some everywhere, who have not grown in 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, 100 years. Have not grown. If I ask you your salvation story, when was it that God changed your life, that you came to knowledge of when God changed your life? You, you might be able to tell me. But then if I ask you, how have you grown since that day? What are you doing to, to grow? How has God, how's your life? Because the old folks used to say, every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. So if I'm still depending on 52 years ago mercy and 52 years ago to my testimony, if I'm still relying on that, I done missed some sweet days with Jesus. So many of us have no deeper spiritual life than we got baptized in the water. A prayer life sometimes is still simplistic and stuck on I and me and has not advanced to praying for we. Dr. Gardner Taylor said, men and women, boys and girls, our own children, our friends are running from hell to hell. They're leaving one hell, going to another hell, but we are not in the agony of prayer for them. 
How often last week were you in the agony of prayer? Did you really earnestly seek God, not for yourself, but for the furloughed federal government workers? Were you in the agony? I, I, I ain't talking about you just, just talking to the Lord passing by. You're getting up in the morning, telling the Lord, watch over them. I, I'm talking about the agony, the agony of prayer. I, 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 I've seen my mama in the agony of sweating and crying, the agony of prayer for your brothers and your sisters. In the agony of prayer, when the gunfire rings in the streets around us, we know the Lord no better and we have no deeper fellowship with him now than we had then. Then we've got to strive for greater. Take a chance. Try it this week. I don't care how young how seasoned you are, young folk, uh, old folk, middle-aged folk, you ought to be striving for a great relationship with God. Take a chance that God has something new to show you, to reveal to you. Take a chance that God has a new territory for you to conquer. You know, God, God didn't stop moving in the book of Acts. He didn't stop moving in Romans and, and Corinthians and Thessalonians. He didn't stop moving in Philippi, Caesarea Philippi, and in Philadelphia, he didn't stop moving. Then you do know God still moves today. He still gives new revelation today. We need to spread the word that you are not designed for goodness. You are made for greatness. I bought my Bible because just so you know, I'm not just get, offering you conjecture. Greater work shall you do. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. If you receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. People who have risen to the heights of their greatness will tell you that they had to do something that took them out of their comfort zone to finally walk in God's greatness. If you're interested, <coughs> if you're interested in just being comfortable, then you'll just be good. If I'm interested in staying the same forever, the greatest I'll be is good. But, but the church of today, the 21st century church, needs people in here who have set your dial to great, and you will not settle for just being good, but you want to walk in the greatness that God promised you. If you like where you are, then stay good. That's all. That, that's cool for you. If you just want to be stuck on, on yourself and me and my, if you just want to do simple charity and not sustain commitment, we need great people who are not committed to only challenging and changing laws, but want to change hearts. That's greatness. That's greatness. In order for God to use you like he's never used you before, you got to do something that you've never done before. You're tired of just being good, tired of that pattern in our lives, tired of attracting the wrong kind of people to your life, tired of struggling to find the right place, tired of feeling stuck in neutral, then you got to start striving for God's greatness. If you want to be great, you got to align your will with the will of God. To be great, you got to seek first his kingdom. Change your mind about God. You got to lift up your head. You got to spend some time alone with Jesus for yourself. Walk worthy of your calling. Walk as a child of the light. Walk with God. Let, let God lead your dance at every step of your journey. One, one time, some years ago, and I'm almost done, Leah, Leah and I were on the beach with our family. And we rented one of those four-person carriages that you had to pedal together for it to go somewhere. It was me, Leia, I think one of the babies, might have been Cana, she was little at the time, and Grandma, Grandma Black. Grandma Black is Leia's grandmama who's going on to be with the Lord. Grandma Black, Leia, me, and baby Cana were peddling this four-person uh, trolley, vehicle, bicycle, whatever you want to call it. And so Leia and I, strategically, we were young and vibrant at the time. And so we, I sat up, up front, and she sat in the back, and we said, well, we can, we can handle it without Grandma and Cana peddling. Le Leia's, so we peddling, we peddling, and all we're doing is veering off to the side and falling in the ditch at the beach and going over into the sand. Baby, what are you doing? Why are you not pedaling? You, you, I'm pedaling as hard as I can, Leah says, and I'm pedaling as hard as I can. But we look back at Grandma Black, Grandma wasn't pedaling. 
Grandma was chilling, let the young folk do all the work. So we swerved and slowed and went over into the grass because guess what? We weren't working together. Help me, Holy Ghost. I'm going somewhere. What we discovered was the key wasn't just working together. It was synchronicity. You know what synchronicity is? We all needed to be pedaling the same way, at the same pace, at the same time. See, I was good riding a bike by myself. Yeah, brother, and Leah and I would tear up a tandem bicycle. If it's just me and her, oh, we can get it. We can get it together. But, but the routine got thrown off because we were out of sync with our partner, Grandmama. We needed Grandmama to pedal at the same pace we were pedaling. And, and guess what? If the lead is right pedaling, then all of us got to be pedaling. Ah, with that right foot. And, and, if, and if we decide we're going to lead with the left foot, then... And all of us got to lead with the left foot. We got to pedal with the left foot uh, because you need synchronicity in order to be great. And see, God is tired of you and I trying to take the lead and moving in the opposite direction that God is moving in. If you wonder why your life drifts off to the side and goes into a ditch, it's because you're not letting God lead you in synchronicity. If God is going left and you moving right, then you ought to sync with God. Uh, but if you want to be great, then you better learn how to move the way God is moving. Uh, if God moves left, guess what you and I ought to do? We ought to slide to the left. If God slides to the right, then you ought to slide to the right. If God crisscrosses, then guess what? You ought to crisscross just like the Lord. It doesn't matter where God does it. You got to do what God is doing. Strive for greatness. I'm done. In, in 1715, King Louis XIV of France died after reigning for 72 years. I'm done. After this, he called himself the great and was the monarch who made famous the statement, I am the state. Sound like, sound like, uh. I don't even like calling his name. His court was the most magnificent in Europe, and his funeral was equally spectacular. King Louis the 14th, and as his body lay in state in a golden casket. Orders were given that the cathedral should be dimly lit with only a special candle set above his coffin. So everything was dark except this one light above his co coffin to dramatize how great he was. Everybody, all eyes on me. At the memorial, thousands waited in silence and in the dark. One candle, then, then the bishop, the preacher, got up, Bishop Massillon got up and began to talk. And when he got up, the first thing he did was he blew out the candle. <sighs> blew it out. And he said, only God is great. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. You know why he's great? Because before the mountains were brought forth, God was there. Where were you when the blueprints to the earth got revealed? Uh, before stars marched into the sky, God was there. He was there when David was anointed to be king. Uh, he was there when Joseph got thrown into that pit. Uh, he was there when Joshua marched himself around Jericho's walls because uh, he is the greatest. Uh, he was there when Ezekiel saw dry bones in the valley. Uh, he was there when Elijah was running from Jezebel. Uh, he was there when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, the Lord is here right Right now. Huh? He was there when you were born uh, those years ago. Huh? And guess what? On a Friday, uh, over 2,000 years ago, huh? he put his greatness on display. Huh? On that Friday, he became our door to the Father. Huh? He gladly gave up his life huh? so you and I could be great. Huh? And he's great enough huh, to tell the wind to be quiet. Huh? He's great enough huh, to tell thunder to be still. Huh? He's great enough huh, to tell lightning to stop flashing. Huh? He's great enough huh, to die and save the whole world. The Bible says that when Jesus died, the earth began to shake because he is the greatest. Great enough to die so you might have life. He's great enough to save our soul. He's great enough to make you whole. He's great enough to bring new life. But I'm so glad. I'm so, so glad. I'm so, so glad that early on Sunday morning, 
morning. He was great enough to rise from the grave. He's great enough to have all power. Is there anybody here that's glad that you serve a great God? Great enough to send you the Holy Ghost. Great enough to sit at the right hand of the Father. He's great enough to intercede on your behalf. He's great enough to be your door to the Father. If you have not already, you better go through the door. He's a safe door. He's a strong door. He's a wide door. He's a door of hope, a door of joy, a door to heaven, a door to eternity. He's the only door. The door that gets you to where God is. Is there anybody here that's going through the door? Say yes. 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 Make the great I am your all and he'll be everything that you need. If you want to unlock the godness, the greatness inside of your life, serve with gladness. Strive for greatness. Greater works, greater works shall you do because I've gone to the Father. Greater than Jesus. You think about that. Stand with me. Greater than Jesus. You do know Jesus raised the dead. Jesus healed the sick. Opened up blinded eyes. Calm the raging seas. Spoke peace to the wind and the waves. And it went silent. Yeah, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus took water, turned it into wine. Jesus delivered the Gadarene demoniac from his demons. And this same Jesus says, greater works shall you do because I'm going to the Father. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege. It is to carry everything to him, to God, in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit, give it away. Oh, what needless pain we bear. We didn't have to bear that like that. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you for your word. And we ask God that we would commit day by day for this week, God, every day that you allow us to see to serving with gladness and to striving in that day for your greatness. To commit, God, to being in the agony of prayer for our brothers and our sisters. 